السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, To carry on with the general anatomy lecture I'm gonna talk today about the muscular system I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, professor and head of anatomy department at Mansoura University uh, The objectives of uh, my lecture today is about the following First we will learn some definitions Then we will talk about the types of the muscles in our body Then we will compare between these muscle types and we will focus on uh, one type of the muscle which is the skeletal muscles and we will learn their function and then uh, we will talk about its connective tissue covering how it is constructed or the different parts of the skeletal muscle and uh, the naming of the skeletal muscles where the names come from and finally we'll talk about the classification of the skeletal muscle so what is the origin of the word muscle the word muscle is the diminutive of the Greek word mus, which means mouse. So what's the resemblance between the mouse and the muscle? If you look at this mouse, this is its head, and this is its body, and this is its tail. So the body and the head of the mouse represent the belly of the muscle, or looks like the belly of the muscle, and the tail of the mouse looks like its tender. That's why they call these structures muscles. If we look at this diagram, we have three different types of muscles in our body. We have the cardiac muscle, the skeletal muscle, and the smooth muscle. If we compare these three types regarding their site, contraction, or supply, shape, number of nuclei, presence or absence of striation, branching, and fatigability. So the skeletal muscles attach it to our skeleton. We can find the smooth muscles in the wall of the viscera. We can find the cardiac muscle, of course, in the wall of the heart. For contraction, the skeletal muscle is under our voluntary control, while the smooth and the cardiac are involuntary muscles. That's why the nerve supply of the skeletal muscle by the somatic nervous system, while the smooth and the cardiac by the autonomic nervous system. For the shape of the skeletal muscle fibers, they are tubular or cylindrical in shape. The smooth muscle looks like spindle or fusiform in shape. The cardiac muscle again looks tubular or cylindrical in shape. For the number of the nuclei, the skeletal muscle has many nuclei. We call it multi-nucleated, while the smooth and the cardiac are uni or single nucleated. For the absence or presence of striations, the skeletal muscles are striated. While the smooth, there is no striations, and the cardiac muscle fiber again is striated. For the branching, the skeletal and the smooth muscles, they are individual, they do not branch, while the cardiac muscle fibers are uh, branching. For the fatigability, the skeletal muscle easily get fatigued, while the smooth muscle not easily to get fatigued, while the cardiac muscle fiber, there is no fatigability in this type of muscle fibers. Back to this diagram, it shows us the shape of the muscle fibers here this is the cardiac muscle you can notice that it is tubular in shape has striation has branching communicate with other uh, cardiac muscle fibers and is uninucleate here the skeletal muscle fiber it is cylindrical or tubular in shape striated multinucleated and not branching and this is the smooth muscle fiber or smooth muscle cell it is fusiform in shape there is no striations and it is uninucleated and there is no branching in these uh, muscle fibers. Of course, the first thing that comes into our mind is movement or locomotion. It can uh, maintain our posture and stabilize our joints. That's why in old people where is weakness of the muscle, the old people cannot maintain their posture. That's why they lean forward. By their contraction, they produce energy. And with the help of the contraction of the skeletal muscles around the veins of the lower limb, for example, they keep the blood and the lymph moving inside the blood vessels and the lymph vessels. Also, the skeletal muscles protect the internal organs, like here in the anterior abdominal wall. So by contraction of these muscles, they keep the internal organs protected or in place. That's why when there is weakness of this uh, muscles, the patient may suffer from hernia, like protrusion of the internal organs to the outside. 
In this diagram, we choose a section in the skeletal muscle. We can notice that it's made of muscle bundles. Each bundle, like this one, contains individual muscle fibers like this. So, we have the outer covering of the whole skeletal muscle. It's called epimysium. And this is a connective tissue layer that covers the whole or the entire muscle. Around each muscle bundle from inside, we have what's called peri. Mission. This is uh, the connective tissue that surrounds the bundles of muscle fibers. The third type of connective tissue is called endomysium. Endo means inside. So the endomysium is the layer of connective tissue that covers or surrounds the individual muscle fibers. So again, the connective tissue covering of the muscle from outside to inside, we have the epimysium, covers the whole muscle. The perimysium surrounds the muscle bundles. And the endomysium surrounds the individual muscle fibers. So the three main parts of the muscle, we have the fleshy part or the belly of the muscle, which is the largest part of the muscle, contains the contractile muscle fibers. And we have two attachment points. The proximal attachment is called the origin of the muscle. And if you revise uh, the first lecture of about medical terminology, Proximal means close to the shoulder or close to the hip joint. So the origin is the proximal attachment of the muscle and usually on the fixed bone, the bone that will be stable, not moving. The other point of attachment is called insertion and it is the distal attachment of the muscle and it is usually on the moving bone. So upon contraction of this muscle, the insertion will get close to the origin means that the humerus will move towards the scapula. So the attachment of the muscle, either by its origin or insertion, can be one of three types. Either direct fleshy attachment, like these red muscle fibers is attached directly to the bone, or by tendon, or by something called aponeurosis. So what's the difference between the tendon and aponeurosis? If we look at this area, this is the tendon, which looks like a cord, or it is spread like a sheet. In this case, we call it aponeurosis. So upon contraction of this uh, muscle, the fleshy part, as you can see, is the one that contracts. It will pull the insertion towards the origin, leading to action. So muscles can be named according to their shape. For example, we have this muscle, which covers the tip of the shoulder. It's called deltoid muscle. If we prick the name of this a muscle, oid, means looks like. And delta is the Greek letter, which is equivalent to the letter D. And it is drawn like a triangle. So deltoid looks like a triangle. Sometimes we call the muscle according to the number of their heads or their origins. Like this muscle, it has double origin from the skeleton. So it has two heads. So we call it biceps. Bi means two, seps means heads. If it has three heads, we can call it triceps. If it has four heads, we call it quadriceps, and so on. Sometimes we need to add the location or the site of the muscle to distinguish it from another muscle. Again, this muscle lies in the arm, so we call it biceps brachii. Brachium means arm, so biceps brachii means that the muscle which has two heads that lies in the arm. Sometimes we name the muscles according to their size, like these two muscles. They look the same, looks like rhombus, that's why they call it rhomboid, but one is small, we call it rhomboidus minor, the other one is big, so we call it rhomboidus major. And also muscles can be named according to their action, like those who rotate the spine or rotate the vertebral column, that's why we call them the rotators. We can classify the skeletal muscles according to the arrangement of the muscle fibers into parallel or oblique or pinnate, or we can classify the skeletal muscles according to their action. We have four types, agonists, antagonists, synergists, and fixators. If you have a muscle that its fibers run in a parallel way, so you end up 
with a quadrilateral shaped muscle or if it is a little bit longer you end up with a strap like muscle or sometimes you have a strap like muscle with tendinous intersections like this big muscle in front of your belly it's called the rectus abdominis muscle sometimes the muscle looks fusiform in shape like it has narrow attachment up and down and the the middle part is expanding like this the arrangement of the muscle fibers uh, is oblique so you end up with a triangle like this famous muscle on the front of the chest it's called pectoralis major muscle so you can see that it has a wide origin and a narrow insertion and the fibers has to go in an oblique way sometimes you get a muscle which looks like a sphincter because the muscle fibers run in a circular way you can find these around the openings in our body just to control this opening to close it or uh, to squeeze it sometimes the arrangement of the muscle fibers take a pinnate shape or feather like so you may have a tendon here and the muscle fibers uh, are attached to it from one side like this one so in this case we call it unipinnate muscle or you have a tendon and the muscle fibers attach it to it from both sides in this case we call it bipinnate muscle or sometimes it is complex in nature in this case we call it multipinnate muscle like this one uh, for the action of the muscles we have the following agonists or prime movers are the muscles that is directly involved in causing an action for example if i want to flex my elbow so the prime movers in this case will be the muscles in front of the humerus like the brachialis and the biceps brachii in this case they are the prime movers if i want to undo this movement so the antagonist they oppose the movement of the agonist in this case will be the triceps sometimes there are muscles they work together and cause the same movement the last type are called fixators they fix uh, the proximal joint during movement of the distal joints in this diagram you can see the scapula and the upper end of the humerus and these small muscles they fix the upper end of the humerus or the shoulder joint while you are moving your distal joint um, this is the end of my presentation thanks for listening if you like it please do not forget to subscribe like and share and also hit the notification bell so you know if I upload another video. Thank you.